Okay, so welcome to this next video in the playlist on the cardiovascular system. In this video, what we're going to do is we're going to uh, look at the mechanisms underlying, uh, well, underlying the vasodilatation which happens in response to shear stress. So, this video is going to be on hemodynamic shear stress, so I'll just say shear stress, and its relation to the endothelium derived relaxation factor pathway and EDFR. Endothelium derived relaxation, oh sorry, EDRF rather than EDFR. EDRF, endothelium derived relaxation factor. Right. Okay, so, firstly, a little introduction then. We have discussed in the previous video uh, what shear stress actually is, but I'll just remind you. It is the frictional force, effectively, on the wall of a blood vessel. So if we have a blood vessel here, okay, and then we have blood flowing through this blood vessel, let's say, in this direction here. So we have these blood cells, and also all the little molecules that are in this blood, including, including the water. Uh, so all of the particles that are moving in this direction, basically. And then we have our endothelial cell. So let's say this thin little cell here is the endothelial cell, and we'll color this in orange here. Okay, so this is our endothelial cell in orange. Now, basically, what's going to happen is, as this flows over the endothelial cell, little particles are going to collide with little particles of the endothelial cell, and you're going to continually be being bashed, effectively. This endothelial cell is going to be continually bashed by particles, and that bashing is what's known as shear stress, basically, or hemodynamic shear stress. So the endothelial cell, effectively, is feeling a force in this direction because particles of the blood are bashing into it. So this is the hemodynamic shear stress. And again, um, this is the British English spelling of heme. Uh, the Amer American English spelling of heme would be just H-E-M-E. -E. So alternatively, if you're using American English, which most of my viewers will be, uh, hemodynamic shear stress. Same thing. Um, get used to both spellings, basically. Okay, right. Uh, so, uh, what's going to happen in response to this? Well, basically, if the hemodynamic shear stress goes up, that indicates that the blood flowing through here is flowing more violently, basically. That you're, it's flowing through Faster. If you've got a greater shear stress, then it means more molecules are coming along here, potentially at greater speeds as well, which con which both sort of uh, infer, well, what you can infer from both of those is that the blood flow through here is faster. Right. So, why would blood flow get faster? Well, it would get faster if the pressure difference between the arterial and the venous side was greater. So if the pressure difference uh, was uh, larger, then that would cause uh, the blood to flow more rapidly through here, because there will be a greater force pushing the blood through. Okay, so what we now want to discuss is what's the endothelial cell's response to this. So firstly, let me tell you what the whole uh, blood vessel's response is. The whole blood vessel's response is uh, that it will get wider, basically. It will vasodilate in response to an increase in hemodynamic shear stress. So, if the force that the endothelial cells are feeling um, increases, basically, then what's going to happen is the blood vessel will vasodilate, or the correct word is vasodilatate. Vasodilatate. So, uh, dilatate. Wait a second, vasodilatate, yes, uh, rather than vasodilate. Vasodilate is a word that is taking over, and everyone uses it because it's just easier to say than vasodilatate. But if you ever have a pernickety physiology teacher, they'll insist that it's um, vasodilatate rather than vasodilate.
Okay, so it causes vasodilatation of the blood vessel, which means the blood vessel's lumen is going to get wider. So basically, it's going to allow more blood to flow through. So this is the... It's a protective response, basically. If you've got blood flowing past here too quickly, then it could... You're risking getting damage to the endothelium, basically. Okay, now, uh, if we vasodilate, or vasodilatate, uh, then the blood will be able to, more blood will be able to flow through, and it will have to flow less quickly, so you'll be able to deliver the blood, um, blood, you'll be able to deliver the same amount of blood, but it won't have to move as quickly because the blood vessel has widened. So, you will reduce the um, sheer stress that the endothelial cells are are feeling, and therefore you'll protect your endothelium. So, what we now want to look at is how. How does the endothelium make the blood vessel dilatate? Well, we've seen this. We know what, what's coming. How do endothelial cells make blood vessels dilatate? They release nitric oxide. Okay, so what's going to happen is when the endothelial cell detects an increase in hemodynamic shear stress, it's going to start producing nitric oxide, so here comes the nitric oxide, which will go to the smooth muscle cells that line it, and the smooth muscle cells will then relax, and that will uh, increase the lumen diameter of the uh, blood vessel. Okay, right, so what we want to understand in this video is how, how do these endothelial cells start producing nitric oxide in response to an increase in shear stress? What detects that? Right, well there is a lot on this. This is an area of current research and there are papers coming out even today about this topic. So I'm going to present you a um, a story that is incomplete, basically. There are a lot of holes in it, but I will try my best to turn it into pathways for you. Okay, right. So, the starting point then. If we have our endothelial cell here. Okay, so here's our endothelial cell, and I will outline this endothelial cell in orange to be consistent. Okay. Then there are mechanoreceptors in the uh, membrane of the cell, basically. And one of these mechanoreceptors that is thought to be extremely important in sensing this hemodynamic shear stress is a channel known as TRIP-V4, okay? So I will put it here. So this is meant to represent something known as TRIP-V4. T-R-P-V4, often uh, pronounced trip for TRP, and then V4. Okay, so this trip V4 protein is believed to be able to sense the mechanical stress that the cell is feeling. So when the shear stress goes up, i.e. when the number of particles of blood that are bashing this trip V4 channel on the side goes up, then what's believed to happen is this trip V4 channel opens. Okay, so it's believed to be a mechanosensor. So I'm colouring it in red here. So this is speculated to be what's known as a mechanoreceptor. So it's going to respond to a mechanical force. Mechanoreceptor. Right. Now, when it opens, what does it conduct? Well, it conducts calcium ions. It's a calcium channel. So, Calcium concentration is much higher in the extracellular fluid, uh, which in this case is blood, than in the uh, intracellular fluid. Calcium concentration in the intracellular fluid is around 100 nanomolar, okay? Whereas, calcium concentration in the extracellular fluid and blood is usually around 1.5 millimolar. So much, much higher, by a fa higher by a factor of 15,000. Okay, so what's going to happen when you open this trip V4 calcium channel is calcium is going to come in, basically. Now, what does calcium do? Well, it's going to bind to uh, calcium, cal oh, well, sorry, it's going to bind to calmodulin. So let's have a brief discussion of calmodulin then. Okay, so calmodulin then. Calmodulin is a protein that in cartoons is often drawn like so. It has these two lobes, shown here. One is known as the N-lobe, so we'll call this the N-lobe, 
and the other is known as the C-lobe, so we'll call this the C-lobe. Okay, right. Now, both the N and the C-lobe have two calcium binding sites. So here are the two calcium binding sites on the N-lobe, and here are the two calcium binding sites on the C-lobe. Okay, now both of these calcium binding sites are what are known as EF hand domains, and I want to explain to you what that means. Okay, so an EF hand domain is a protein structure which is capable of binding to calcium. Okay, so its structure looks something like this. If this line represents the polypeptide, i.e. the polymer of amino acids, then the polypeptide loops around like so and then comes out again. So this line represents the polymer of amino acids. So you've got an amino acid polymerized with another amino acid, joined to another amino acid, etc. Okay, and it forms this loop like so. And this is the EF hand domain, this loop. Okay, now uh, the amino acids in this loop, this looped portion of the polypeptide, they are acidic amino acid residues, generally. You have a lot of acidic amino acid residues. Acidic residues. Okay, now let me give you an example of an acidic amino acid residue to show you why that's going to help us bind calcium. So, uh, an example, an archetypal example of an acidic amino acid residue would be aspartic acid. Okay, so let me draw its structure here for you. So this is the core amino acid structure. So the amino group and the carboxylic acid group here, which of course wouldn't be, um, they wouldn't still exist in the um, polypeptide. They'd be involved in amide links. So you wouldn't have a carboxylic acid group just free in this polypeptide. It would be bound to the amino group of another amino acid. Okay, and then the R group here of aspartic acid is you effectively have ethanoic acid sitting off the side. So this is aspartic acid. Aspartic acid. Okay, now, aspartic acid is an acid. It has this acidic R group here. And the reason it's acidic is that this hydroxyl group, you can break this bond between the oxygen and the hydrogen in, the, um, in this hydroxyl group, and then you don't break it evenly, though. You don't give, you know, this bond here, this covalent bond, one of the electrons came from the oxygen, let's say this cross here, and one of the electrons, this dot, uh, came from the hydrogen, but you don't break it evenly. Both of the electrons go to the oxygen, so the oxygen gets a negative charge, and the hydrogen nucleus, which is generally just a proton, goes off on its own over here. Okay, so uh, that, therefore, you have donated a proton, and that's what acids, that's the definition of an acid, something that is capable of donating protons. Now, when you are left over with this molecule here, which is uh, the aspartic acid molecule, once it's donated its proton away, that is known as the conjugate base of aspartic acid, and it has another name. It's known as aspartate. So if you want to know the strict difference between aspartic acid and aspartate, this is it. Aspartate is the conjugate base of aspartic acid. Aspartic acid means the molecule where it still has this proton attached here. Aspartate means the molecule after it's lost its proton. Okay, and it's what's known as the conjugate base of aspartic acid. And it's called that because it, this chemical species, aspartate, is now a base. This negatively charged oxygen is capable of receiving a proton, so it's gone from being an acid to being a base, basically, a species capable of receiving a proton. Now, if you put a lot of acidic residues here, some of them will donate their protons away and therefore will become negatively charged. And this isn't just a phenomenon that happens to aspartate. All of the conjugate bases will have a negative charge after they've donated their proton away. Uh, so you're going to get a lot of negatively charged uh, R groups facing into this loop. And that is why this becomes ideal for coordinating a calcium ion. And we'll continue this discussion in the next video.